Hello Horror Hounds, it's time once again to look at a film from David Cronenberg's canon. And this particular movie had the tagline, Exterminate All Rational Thought, an excellent piece of advice for anyone approaching for the first time. A film that, how can you make sense of this? How can you string a coherent sentence together? And yet, it falls to me <laughs> to try and talk coherently about Naked Lunch. I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. When this film was released in the UK, I was just a few weeks shy of my 17th birthday. I can vividly remember driving on my own to catch a midnight screening of David Cronenberg's Naked Lunch. It had a very tiny theatrical release and probably that was the only screening that was even available to me and I promptly fell asleep during it, somewhere between Ian Holm explaining to Peter Weller that they weren't communicating verbally but telepathically and woke up right towards the end when Roy Scheider as Dr. Benway tore himself out of um, the body of a completely different character. I take a slight perverse pleasure in the fact that my first viewing of Naked Lunch, I was unconscious for most of it and it was just going in through my ears, directly into my subconscious. I can't really recall the next time I saw the film, which would have been the first time I saw it consciously in its entirety. I do know that since seeing it, I have been in love with it. Peter Weller plays William Lee, a pest exterminator who gets hooked on his own supply of bug powder and soon a large talking beetle tells him that his wife Joan is a spy and he must kill her. It's kind of a fool's errand to try and provide a synopsis for this movie and I will give you a snatch of the plot synopsis from Wikipedia. Whilst Lee is under the influence of assorted mind-altering substances, his replacement Typewriter, a Clark Nova, becomes a talking insect, which tells him to find Dr. Benway by seducing Joan Frost, who curiously is a doppelganger for his dead wife. Lee also encounters a gay Swiss gentleman, Yves Cloquet, who may in fact be a monstrous centipede in disguise. Though this might be a hallucination, after coming to the conclusion that Dr. Benway is in fact a secret mastermind of our narcotics operation for a drug called black meat, which is supposedly derived from the guts of giant Brazilian centipedes, Lee encounters dot 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 and we can leave it there. It is a sort of Alice in Wonderland succession of meetings. Lee goes to a place which might just be in his own mind, a drug adult hallucination called Interzone, where he it may or may not be recruited as a spy, or he may already be a spy, because the best cover for a spy is someone who doesn't know that they were a spy. And whilst he's in Interzone, he meets a succession of people and provides reports back to his handlers, who may be a race of giant insects, who are fighting a race of giant centipedes. Don't sweat the small stuff. Sit back, immerse yourself into the wonderful world of Naked Lunch, a fusion of the literary imagination and images of William Burroughs and the visual mastery of David Cronenberg, because you will be entering a world unlike any you've ever seen before. This is not your normal film adaptation of a book. There are various levels of reality at play in the film, complemented by a multifaceted understanding of the film. You can just watch the film cold if you want, with no need to know anything about Burroughs' book or his life, and I'm sure it still plays a really classy movie, a trippy descent into one man's mania. In a similar vein, maybe, to Jacob's Ladder, where you maybe have an idea of uh, what's real and what's unreal, and that, that ground shifts as the movie uh, develops. That said, my partner watched the film Cold, and she exclaimed out loud, what the fuck, probably about four or five times to my uh, glee. So perhaps Naked Lunch is not for everyone. I don't think that's a controversial statement. However, it is not a straight book adaptation. Cronenberg said that uh, he wanted to start with the text, 
pull back to include the typewriter and then pull back again to reveal the writer at the typewriter, the typist, Burroughs himself. To that end, there are some biographical elements to Naked Lunch. William Lee, Peter Weller's character, is a pseudonym under which William Burroughs published his first book, Junkie. Bill Lee also, I believe, appears as a character in the book Naked Lunch, as well as the film Naked Lunch. Several characters in the film Naked Lunch are loosely based on people Burroughs knew. Hank and Martin, from the New York section, are based on Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, who helped Burroughs compile Naked Lunch, the novel. Tom and Joan Frost in Interzone are perhaps based on Paul and Jane uh, Bowles, who Burroughs befriended in Tangier in Morocco in the early 60s. The shooting of Joan Lee at the start of the film is based tragically on the 1951 death of Joan Volmer, Burroughs' common law wife. Burroughs shot and killed Volmer in a drunken game of William Tell at a party in Mexico City. Burroughs stated that Joan's death was the starting point of his literary career, saying, quote, I am forced to the appalling conclusion that I would never have become a writer but for Joan's death. I'm not a Burroughs scholar. I'm sure there is much, much more going on in this film than even I have any notion of. Um, in a sense, every viewer has to decide how far down the rabbit hole they want to go. Do you just want to watch this cold as a movie or do you want to dig into it? How far down do the centipedes go? Is it maybe centipedes all the way down? So it's not a straight adaptation of William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch. It contains elements from that book to be sure. It also contains elements of some of Burroughs' other books and also elements of the biography that was written about Burroughs. And all of it is filtered through a particularly Cronenbergian lens. Anyway, it might be going too far to see this as a kind of literary, biographical, cinematic brundlefly, uh, uh, a wholly original creation fused together from disparate elements. It might be going too far to say that, but the metaphor is just too delicious to pass up. So the film is in part by a fictionalised biography of William Burroughs and how he came to be a writer. It is in parts an essay on creativity, uh, drug addiction, the perhaps uh, belief certainly uh, around that time, although it's not a belief just of that time, that drugs and creativity uh, go hand in hand. It's a film about addiction and it is very, very much a film about writing. Writing as an act of protest, writing as an act of self-understanding, self-destruction, uh, accessing the most primal, unspeakable, basic thoughts, drives and urges, trying to bypass every construct of yourself that you've created to try and live in a so-called civilised society or a way of moving throughout the world that is acceptable to people. This notion of exterminating all rational thought and getting straight down into the, the limbic system and seeing what comes out there is a very Burroughs kind of idea. And it's absolutely something that uh, Cronenberg is more than capable of riffing on. Howard Shaw is composing the score yet again. Howard Shaw is Cronenberg's go-to composer. Uh, it features also free jazz musician Ornette Coleman and it may well be Howard Shaw's best work to date. As soon as the knowingly Saul Bass opening credits uh, come up with the uh, Howard Shaw's ominous strings and Coleman's uh, jazzy sax playing over it, you, it really transitions you from your own headspace into right now we're moving into this world I need you to completely disconnect from everything that's going on into your life squeegee your third eye clean and sit and wait to receive this story it's it's perfect trans uh, transitionary opening credits and the music is absolutely key to it the music is key to guiding you all the way through you get um, Shaw's um, lush strings and, and, and the accompaniments uh, to those are 
oral cues really to tell you which sort of level of reality you're in. There's, there's, a, there's a New York bit, there's an interzone bit. Uh, there are areas in between and you certainly, you, you get little instrumental cues that, that say, okay, interzone is coming now, the hallucinations are coming or now we're coming out of those and back into New York and the like. It's a really busy, uh, fluttery, insect-like the way the, the, the jazz moves in and out. Um, it's just a beautiful, lush score to go with a gorgeous, maddeningly jazz-like movie that doesn't have to make sense, just has to, just has to be cool, man. Peter Weller is the star. He plays Bill Lee, an analogue clearly of William Burroughs himself. He provides, in a movie where he is surrounded by such crazy stuff, talking insect typewriters, uh, doppelgangers for uh, wives, men that turn into giant predatory sexual centipedes, um, typewriters that exude, uh, well, not to put too fine a point on it, addicted jism if they like what you're writing on it, mugwumps, uh, telepathic conversations, uh, crosses, double crosses, agents, double agents. Just as Alice wanders through Wonderland fairly innocuously, just meeting and greeting the strange procession of people who wash her like flotsam and jetsam throughout this strange period of her life, Peter Weller is an amazing negative space in the film. Surrounded by all these strange and uh, fairly broad, a lot of the time, characters, he's uh, beautifully deadpan and controlled and contained. Comedically so, his sort of non-committal, oh my God, every time he just sees the next completely unbelievable, outrageous thing becomes really hilarious. It almost becomes a punchline in itself. All pinned down by the fact that at his very heart, the reason he's gone this cold, the reason he numbs himself with these anesthetic of these drugs is that there is a, a, a pain and an, uh, an overwhelming guilt, which I believe mirrors Burroughs' own pain and overwhelming guilt throughout his entire life at the things that he has himself done. It's only until the very, very end of the movie that you just see a crack in that just cold shell and you see that uh, perhaps all of this around him has actually just been a projection of the very real turmoil that's been going on inside him this entire time. Judy Davis plays his wife, Joan Lee, and then Joan Frost in Interzone, the doppelganger of his wife. Fans of David Lynch movies will be uh, very au fait with the notion of doppelgangers. And I, in the first portion as Joan Lee, she plays a sort of, well, she, she, she's a junkie in, in the second portion in Interzone. She's a writer. I, do, I can't put my finger on it. I don't know why. She is just so crazily sexy to me in this film. She's sort of cool and detached. She's very much like a noir femme fatale, except she's not, she's not the sort of, um, uh, two-faced, uh, sultry woman that draws our hero into the story and then double crosses him or anything like that. She's not even a character to, to be rescued, even though Bill at times does try to rescue her. Horrifically, she's, as a muse, she's almost grist to his mill. She's almost a means to an end and the horror that he maybe can't quite verbalize that he's trying to damp down and it pops up as different kinds of horrors, the re Freudian return of the repressed. The true horror may be that he just uses her to get to the point where he can do what he needs to do, which is the writing. Ian Holm is here as Tom Frost, Joan's wife in Interzone. He has a fine old time. It's a nice ripe performance for a nice ripe character. 
and uh, ever since I've rewatched, he's got my favourite line in the entire movie. <laughs> ever since I've watched the film, I've occasionally been saying, "It's my Mujahideen." Um, that won't mean anything, obviously, to anyone who hasn't seen the movie, but it's my favourite line of the movie. It's everyone in Interzone is a writer, so for that, you might also say that they're a spy. So you have an entire sort of you have an entire uh, politicised area where everyone is openly a spy in it. It's a weirdly kind of Casablanca type uh, drug fueled fantasy area. But everyone's typewriter is also their contact to, to their spy network. And they're also uh, insects with uh, talking uh, anus bodies underneath their carapaces. But let's not, let's not even go down there. Um, Ian Holmes' character's typewriter is a mujahideen and it gets... It, it meets a sticky end uh, and he's not happy about it. Roy Scheider turns up briefly as Dr. Benway. I always forget that he's, he, he's in it and it's always a pleasure to see Roy Scheider. It's a double pleasure to see Roy Scheider in such a fucking weird film. <laughs> in such a fucking weird role. Seems like a fairly straight-laced performance. You see him towards the start of the movie. When you see him at the end, though, when he just is going gonzo in a, in a bodysuit, chomping on a cigar, he's clearly having the time of his life as well. Julian Sands uh, is, as Julian Sands does, as uh, Eve Cloquet, a sort of predatory homosexual slash centipede in this. I would say that perhaps the representations of homosexuality in this aren't the most favourable, but to be fair, um, they're also not particularly endearing in William Burroughs' original novel. And this is uh, a novel written by a gay man himself. So I'm really not sure that that's a, 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 a scab you want to necessarily start picking at. In working with Burroughs and working with Burroughs' material, David Cronenberg seems to have given himself a hall pass to allow himself to create a very literary film for grown-ups, but at the same time enjoy all of the uh, gleeful, more adolescent um, excesses of his uh, earlier movies at the same time. He gets his cake and he gets to eat it uh, in Naked Lunch. You have your giant insects with uh, anuses for mouths, you have your copious drug-taking hallucinations, doppelgangers, um, the sliding of identities one over another, which is absolutely phenomenal. It sounds phenomenal, it looks phenomenal. Again, Carol Spear, his production designer, does sterling work giving us visual uh, cues. Especially as the movie progresses and some of the interzone sets we then see as New York sets or, or transitionary places between New York and interzone. And uh, in her set design, her gorgeous set design, she gives us cues and clues as to what might be going on. Because no one in this film is going to sit down and tell you. That's the thing I adore about it the most. It's a grown up film. It, le it lets you decide, but it also demands that you pay attention. Peter Weller has a monologue towards the end of the movie, which is lifted, a skit lifted verbatim from Burroughs' text, that of the talking asshole. And whereas with previous films I've talked about Cronenberg's usual repudiation of Cartesian philosophy, um, he's moving here into real Freudian psychoanalysis. And Cronenberg has always delighted in a little of the Freudian. You only have to look at Marilyn Chambers' vampiric armpit cock to understand that. Here, the, the talking asshole is the, the id wanting supremacy or at least equality with the ego. It wants a say, it wants to be loved. Even though the words are 100% those of Burroughs, there is an amazing Venn diagram overlap between what Burroughs is saying in that skit and what Cronenberg has been seeming to say for his entire cinematic career up until this point. Cronenberg has always been the champion of the talking asshole. The body has always had the final say over the mind. Um, because this is a truth that Cronenberg has understood from the very first. Um, Aristotle died, Plato, 
died. Albert Einstein, Alexander the Great, all died. No matter what your accomplishments or lofty, artistic, intellectual, philosophical achievements, your body will fail you in some way, somehow. It will always have the final word. All hail the new flesh, same as the old flesh. Your body will let you down and your mind will never be able to save you.